Hey, Peter. Hey. Today, we are listening to one of the most popular jazz albums of all time. Oh, no, we did that a couple weeks ago. It's not that one. What? No, but then the other one a couple weeks before that. It's not that one either. Really? No. It's this one. That's right. That's right. Is that a good way to conduct it? I'm Adam Manis. And I'm Peter Martin. And you're listening to the You'll Hear It podcast. Music Explored. Explored, brought to you today by Open Studio. Go to openstudiojazz.com for all your jazz lesson needs, Peter. And your free trial. And your free trial. There's if it's still happening. It is still it's happening. It's not going to go on forever. And it won't. I'm just putting likely. that out there. Yes. Uh, but yeah, check out openstudiojazz.com. So Peter, yes. today's the day, man. Here we are. <laughs> We're sitting it's on... Recording day. It's recording <laughs> day. It's you'll hear a recording We're day. going to be listening to an album that we've had a lot of requests for. Yes. This is an album that uh, I grew up with. My dad was a big fan of this album. Yeah. And had it on vinyl, had it on CD. I'm pretty sure had it on cassette. Nice. And so maybe eight track. I don't know. Multi-formatted. Multi-formatted. Uh, it is, of course... Laser disc, perhaps? Uh, no. Betamax? The no, making of? That's a video <laughs> okay. medium. That's right. No, this is, of course, Dave Brubeck's 1959 masterpiece, Time Out. Yes. Uh, this is, of course, one of the most popular, best-selling jazz albums of all time. It was a cultural phenomenon at its time. And, Peter, we're going we're gonna to put it through our What Makes This Album great rating system now our the matrix the the yeah. what makes this album great matrix it's really it's a gauntlet yes. if an album can make it through there <laughs> right then it's really no we've uh, we've patented uh, this this list so uh, it is really we've tested it we've had engineers from Red Bull Racing take a look at it <laughs> and really put it through the ringer as we've far had top, as like top scientists from MIT that's right check our math uh -huh. yeah that's right <laughs> i don't know why scientists and, would check no no math, because but... it is very important that this that this list is preserved and that it is effective right so we're going to be putting time out through here now this is not an album i think that a lot of modern jazz musicians refer to as a, like pretty influential on them you never not, hear it talked about we don't really talk about hardcore. it the, the, the jazz police are so against this album i think it's that true. they don't even they don't even arrest it and maybe we could talk about <laughs> it's that it's outside as we, of its jurisdiction yeah we could talk about that as we listen to it i'm actually kind of stoked to listen to this yeah because i haven't heard it really giving it like a nice pure listen in a while you know yeah. what i mean like, i don't know that i've ever listened to this whole album i'm me, ashamed to say me, i think I, that i was influenced by the jazz police growing up i must have at some point because yeah, like I'm i sure said I've my dad it, loves but, this album but yeah i really don't i i never really checked it out on my own time because i think it has this reputation as being like it's a poppy jazz album you know right. what i mean it's in it's in like lexus commercials that kind of thing you <laughs> know what i'm saying i know right yeah that so kind of. and of course it features what you were just playing uh, Dave Brubeck's most famous composition. Take five. Right. And which that, is not Dave Brubeck's most famous composition, actually. Oh, it's not? What is? It's not written by Dave Brubeck. It's right. It's Paul Desmond. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Our first little controversy yeah. there, right? You know, there's a couple of Earth, Wind & Fire tunes <laughs> that also are not written by... They're written by Paul Desmond, right? <laughs> written by Paul Desmond. Saxophonist uh, Paul Desmond, who sound and, 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 and flavors all over this record. Oh, what a course. sound. Yeah. Uh, this whole album, actually, what a sound. Yeah. 1959, man. Something. There was something magical going on in those consoles on that year. Because, right. yeah, kind of blue. You got this. You got. And we'll maybe talk about that a little bit in lore, because I think I have a little bit of insider information. Yeah. Well, not really. Well, but I think another insight. reason why this album is kind of is not a popular one for jazz musicians is if you've ever played a bunch of jazz gigs or background music gigs or anything. Right. It's like it's it's take five, play take five. Yeah. It's play take five. It's play Linus and Lucy from Peanuts. Yep. Right. It's play any kind of like quote unquote jazzy, uh, popular cultural cultural reference we get called like every gig and yeah. it can get very annoying, frankly. Yeah. And so this is one that it's like, nobody really ever calls it on their own because people are going to shout it out. Like people shout out, you know, play Freebird at rock concerts. Yeah. So it's kind of one of those cult, I mean, it's kind of suffers from its own popularity. Right, right. You know? But this is interesting that this record was so popular. Um, we were looking up, it's at least 2 million sold, probably 3 million by now. It was certified double platinum, but back in 2011. Crazy. According to my insider sources at Wikipedia uh, in Berlin. But um, 
the record starts, and I don't know what you were planning on playing first, but we could start at the beginning. It's yeah. a very unique, I mean, it's a very melodic record, very interesting rhythms on it. So I understand why it was popular. It's a very beautiful sounding record, That's right. great playing and stuff. Um, but it, it's got some tricky uh, time signatures that one would not normally associate with um, a big hit record beyond the jazz world. Yeah. So it's a little bit of a weird dichotomy or, or like the... We're saying the snobs, although we don't have to, officially we don't have the snob meter anymore, but we can still talk about jazz we snobbery. Have we have the stank face We have the stank face meter yeah. right. Well, let's go through our categories really yeah. quick because we're going to start listening to this record and we, we need to start paying attention to the categories. So we have 10 categories. Each one is worth 10 points. And at the end of this episode, we will add up the points right. and see what we have. So We should score each other on our addition. <laughs> like how <laughs> really? we should so, give each other a score on how well we add and that up could be the 11th score. category the bonus yeah. <laughs> yeah so we'll have stank face meter okay so uh category number one is the playing yes. literally how how good is the playing how good is the improvisation category number two is the vibe and that's like the overall vibe of the record of i think the feeling that it gets you right yeah. is it a, does it have uh, a good does it leave you with a good vibe uh category number three are compositions Category number four is sound. Yep. Category number five is sequence, as in the order of the tracks on the album. Is it effective? Category number six is cover art. Mm -hmm. Category number seven is title. Category number eight is lore. Category number nine used to be the snobometer, but we're now <laughs> we've replaced that with the stank face o meter. <laughs> I Which love is, the way you're saying it just so seriously. The stank face well, meter. Like I said, Adrian Newey from Red Bull Racing is going to check these, so I have to be very accurate with my speech. Stank face o meter, which is going to be registering how crooked up do our faces get as we listen to Woo. this. And then <laughs> category number 10 is, is it better than kind of blue? Now, someone in the comments pointed out that about four of our categories really are just it's the same thing. <laughs> how good is this album? <laughs> Well, but that's that's these are all the elements that come together to give a, a, a rating. You know yeah. what I mean? Like you could put vibe and stank <laughs> playing, face on meter, much. and is it better than kind of blue and playing as how good is that's right. just the rating the album. Now those people are wrong because exactly. we take these very seriously. There are subtle nuances that it, your average listener might not be catching. Exactly. Just yeah. saying. We, it's all here for good fun. Yeah. And look, several folks have been commenting that first of all thank you for the comments on the youtube even if you're listening to us on the audio pod og listeners we love you we for love real. you very yeah, much they're our favorites keep on listening but yeah. um maybe if you want to make a comment or participate in the discourse and converse with other um lovers of jazz and the you'll hear a podcast jazz come on over to us. the youtube um and just search for us but we're on open studio channel now <sighs> okay, which may or may not be keeping going anyway side note but i'm saying like several people have <laughs> are we squirreling our way through <laughs> we're this? Scrolling. no several people have mentioned that it's ridiculous to give like score it like it's an athletic event and those people are correct oh okay it is ridiculous <laughs> but it's fun but we're doing it anyway we're doing it yeah. anyway well let's jump into it let's start with the first track Peter. yeah this is blue rondo a la turk written by Dave Brubeck. Written by whom? Dave Brubeck. Dave Brubeck. Here Never heard of him. I had to play this a few times. I think so. It's hard. Yeah. That's some nice inner voice movement there. Tune, it's it? really enjoyable. Nice way to start an album, too. Kind of got an epic arc to the melody, too.
Personnel on this too, by the way, we have, of course, Dave Brubeck on piano, Paul Desmond on the alto saxophone, Eugene Wright on the bass, and the great Joe Morello on drums. It's a nice little rhythm section there. So you probably couldn't tell on the melody that this is a blues. <laughs> is incredible. Bass up front. Rubeck is strolling here. There's no right. there's no piano accompaniment at all. Sounds pretty bad, actually. Crazy to this record was this on the pop album charts? This was number two on the pop charts. On the pop charts. Yeah. Like this is some extended, like just a blues. Seven jazz minute blues. Play. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. Well, it starts in nine eight. The rhythm section sounds good. Also, like the solo was over there, right? Is this an yeah. add-on? You know, Brubeck's playing has always been a mystery to me. I don't yeah. really get it. No. And maybe it's me, but I don't understand. Thank you for saying that. I agree. Do you agree? Like, yeah. it's not... I know, I mean, he's not really talked about as, like, a great jazz pianist. He's talked about with these great records that he but made. But, like, great... what he's playing here is really good. Well... On, on like, a phrase-by-phrase phrase Phrase-by-phrase, phrase, phrase, but there's a whole that's kind of... Yeah. There's, a, there's something missing, you know? Right. Com Composition-wise, it's... Yeah. I think it's incredible. How do you like that juxtaposition between the... the it's okay. Group? Yeah. Yeah, it's... The whole thing feels a little... And this is, I think, what it's meant to feel. Disjointed. A little bit. Yeah. And maybe a little bit, like, from that time. Like, not timeless. A little dated, maybe? A little dated, for sure. Because it feels a little like... Even the... Okay. So I think it's like... It's like music school of the time yeah. classical music school meets jazz right like even a little the title, bit of the hints into the far east a little bit yeah you know? exactly yeah. even the title blue rondo a la turk sounds like right. something that is you know blue right, right. and then rondo, rondo which is classical and a la turk is like it's very mid-century yeah for how to think about right music and i think the music is as well yeah it's 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 got a vibe for sure. There's no doubt about it. Like the composition is incredibly enjoyable, yeah. especially in the beginning there. Like the blues in the middle, Paul Desmond. That's a killing solo. Killing solo. Yeah, I think Brubeck coming after that it maybe seemed even a little weaker because it was coming after a really strong solo. Yeah, and you know just Brubeck. He's I'm I'm not dogging Brubeck. I think he was a 
very talented musician who yeah. can really make these incredible records and put together these bands. But he's not talked about, about amongst pianists as like a very influential figure. Yeah. And I think it's because he doesn't have like a very, he doesn't have a very copyable voice. Like yeah. it's not a voice that, I think it's because it's this mix of classical. Are you classical, doing that Brubeck thing there? Yeah, it's not <laughs> like, well, what is that? It's yeah. like this mix of classical into jazz, but his soloing itself is like, it sounds almost like he's trying to, to get to some kind of Oscar Peterson-ness at right. some points, but it just doesn't have the same like fifth gear that Oscar and has. And there was and even a little bit on that blues, like almost trying to be like a, a monk, like a minimalist, like a minimalist like monk, monk kind yeah. of thing. But it also just doesn't have the sort of swing that monk might have. Yeah. As far as like uh, just this like real command of the language that he's he's attempting. Not, I mean, again, I, I think what he does, what he's good at, he's really really good at. Um, but yeah, so for me, man, playing on this, uh, by the way, rhythm section, Eugene Wright and, and uh, Joe Morales swinging. That was great. Yeah. And then like able to hand the, handle those those odd meters too. I'm going to go playing on this whole album. Well, I'm going yeah, to save it. I'm going to okay. save it. I tell you what, though, for vibe, as far as the overall vibe, I'm going nine. I'm going to put that right out there. And then compositions, I'm going to go, well, it's, I'm going to. This thing, I don't know this record well enough <laughs> right. to kind of like Let's, start. Are we, are we prejudging it? <laughs> Let's check out the next track, Strange Metal Lark. Piano's out of tune. That's not great. Although I am hearing yeah, it tuning. Everything it. sounds amazing, but the piano. I know. Also, we are having our piano tuned in the next room, yeah. so we can kind of hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. That's good playing. Yeah. He's... No, he was a great pianist. I, I know, got man. to hear him live. Well, the... I actually opened up a concert for him twice. And apparently nothing but... I've, I've, I've never met him. I know you've met him. Yeah. But I've met so many people that have spent time oh, with him and like one of the, the sweetest great guy all-time great human yeah. beings. Um, and great it, teacher, it's... great, great just ambassador of the music. For sure. And I have had to play Blue Rondo a la Turk and like Kathy's Waltz on a couple... And Everybody's yeah. Jumping. And that shit is hard to play. Yeah. Like, what he wrote is really hard to play. Oh, tune it up. A little four minor action. Tune. This reminds me of some of the stuff he wrote. You, you know, he wrote a Broadway musical called The Real Ambassadors. Yeah, yeah. I that was that. a really important work, but it was for some reasons not, I don't think, because of the artistic vitality of it. Uh, it never took off for some purely business reasons. Uh, is this I, one of his, Strange Metal Lark? Yeah, I think everything on here except for Take Fire is. Sorry, I cut you off. I interrupted you. My bad. Yeah, no, but this reminds me of some of his writing. I got a chance to, I actually music directed a revival of it at Jazz Lincoln Center a few years ago. Paul Desmond. It's an interesting kind of, definitely that kind of like West Coast art pepper. For sure, yeah. But he's got the Lee Konitz. Yeah. Got some Cannonball. Shout out to the reverb on this record too. I know, wow. Thank you, 30th Street uh, Columbia Recording yeah. Studio in the chamber, the church. Yeah, it's a beautiful composition. Yeah. Was this popular because people would get it, put it on their LP, and then drink their um, Mai Tais? Got a mad men vibe. Modern, yeah, you know. it's got a Mad Men vibe. Yeah, it is a vibe. But this wasn't the first record that had and this again, kind of check sound. Check out Ru Rubeck strolling that whole first part. Actually, he was playing just a little bit, real quietly. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, very quiet. Mm. 
Would he was super he relaxed? Influenced by Bill Evans, or were they influenced by the same people? Would you say? That's a good question. I yeah. don't know. I don't know. I mean, he would have been about the same age, maybe. I'm okay with that. Yeah, no, he was way older than Bill Evans. Oh, yeah. there you go. Solo. No, again, it's it's not. It's yeah. nice and relaxed, and it sounds good, but it's there's nothing. Yeah, it's not like the. There's not a lot of meat on the. Yeah, not like con- a Paul Desmond solo where you were like, whoa, you know, yeah. stank face moments. There's yeah. things going on. But again, maybe it's that, you know, this, again, one of the best-selling jazz albums of all time. Maybe it's that light touch, that sort of like not trying to do too much yeah. vibe that has made it so universally loved by yeah. people who aren't necessarily hardcore jazz fans. Like, they're not out there trying to listen to Cecil Taylor. Maybe. Or know? maybe it's just because of the next tune that we're going to listen to. 100%. <laughs> maybe that's, you like, are, was such a big hit. That, you are 100 Because this right. is not even particular. You can't even say, like, oh, people like this because they can put it on in the background, which you kind of could. You could. But there's enough, like, changes, like, from solo piano open to, like, it's not, like, just undercurrent, like, background music. Well, I don't know. It might be. Really? Yeah. I mean, Blue Rondo like Turk is not, like, that's kind of in your that face is, a little true. bit. That's true. That's true. But this, yeah, people like this. I like it. Come to Infinity's Memorial Day sale today. <laughs> sale Lexus ends. or Infinity? Make up your mind. <laughs> sale ends you July 6th. <laughs> I think the sound and the mix on this and the composition and the... the the light touch. It's a 10 out of 10. But the, uh, the vibe on, yeah. on this is 10 out of 10. Yeah, they song. nailed the vibe on this The tune. vibe is there. Compositionally, this is a very well-balanced tune. Paul Desmond Not crushes. offensive, but got some bluesy, you know. Like, this is kind of the epitome of what I think most people feel is West Coast. For sure. Precursor to smooth jazz. For sure. What do they call it? Cool jazz. Minimalist. Nothing extra. Ah. You know what's very different? This and A Love Supreme. This is very different from A Love Supreme, yes. has a bit of like jazz goes to college kind of flavor, you know? Yeah. I mean, this is almost more modal in a way than like the way he's playing. The straight Dorian, right? This is, but you don't think of this as modal jazz. It is technically, it right? Is, yeah. It's just one chord. Two chords. I guess it's a yeah. B flat minor, but it's all 
relatively E flat yeah. minorish. Yeah. It's a vamp. There's a lot of nothing hap not, not nothing happening for it's being just a, a vibe. Hit. <laughs> it's just yeah. a vibe. It's like a strong melody. Yeah. And then a vibe. Like a nice solo, melodic solo. It's a drum solo. Yeah. It's a killing drum solo. Joe Morello. arc to it though doesn't it this it does have a bit of a <laughs> weird arc <laughs> no. that's him that is no yeah that's iconic <laughs> listen to the reverb on those drums <laughs> the whole thing is very surprised this is such a hit because it's, it's got a lot of things that would be going against it being a big hit yeah like a three minute drum solo <laughs> yeah a three minute drum solo over a vamp with really hip playing but not really that cohesive in my opinion That's not a storytelling kind of solo, is it? It's almost like a drummer solo, like. Really. That was kind of a weird transition too, wasn't it? I have to say though, as we're now we're three songs in it's a fairly original record yeah you know what i mean it's kind of weird it's kind of strange be like like know, if it wasn't so universally popular yeah i'd be like i think i'd be more like wow this is like brave almost this yeah is like it's weird it's, it's a weird record it's weird <laughs> it's kind of unique and like who else is making a record like this at this time right you know what i mean yeah i mean the things Peter, that they do we like time out <laughs> No, you know what to tell you the truth? I'm not sure I like this that much. <laughs> no, no, no. no, I mean, because I love weird stuff. It's not traditionally swinging at no, all. No, but there is, I mean, they are swinging on it. Yeah. At a lot. Like, that was a really good drum solo. Like, there were so many cool things that happened in it, but it wasn't like, it wasn't a compelling solo to me. But, and I, look, I hate, I, I would hate for somebody to sit there and pick apart one of my solos. Absolutely. It'd be very easy to yeah, say. Yeah, I know. That. Like, it's a weird, I'm not, like, it, it, it's, it's great playing. I don't yeah, think there's four anything of these, on here. All four of these players are obviously masters at what they do. They're and we're not all, just yeah. saying that no, no, because no, 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 no. Like, we're supposed to say that. You can hear that. It's it's evidence. Yeah. So, I mean, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, there was almost like some kind of insider stuff, wink, wink, that he yeah. did in that drum solo that only drummers or rhythm section players would really appreciate, which is just what's weird about that is that it's such a big hit. Yeah. You know, I like it. I mean, I, I like that kind of thing. And not every solo has to be an epic, like direct, have the directionality of like, you know, an Elvin Jones, you know, incredible thing. There's something thing. killing about that Joe Morello solo though. There's something, even though it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> AF. There's I something... thought it was killing. I just think it was. It, it's, it was a meandering. Would that be the wrong word to say? Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Can, can, I'm gonna give it a floor run and see if I can play that out there. It, maybe. It, maybe a little. Maybe yeah. a little. Maybe it was just a little too long. Maybe a little too long. But it's also over a vamp and the length of it. It's kind of like solo. We need a couple more minutes. You know. Yeah. It would be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's but keep... I would say that the power of a beautiful melody. You know. Mm -hmm. That's got the little blues inflection, kind of little pentatonic, like. A really great melody with like great sound, a fabulous drum groove that introduces it. And then, you know, 
Great Bridge. Maybe we'll play the recording. <laughs> <laughs> we just did. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird record, especially the way I play it. <laughs> it's really weird. No, but I mean, a beautiful melody, a beautifully balanced composition. Totally. Beautifully played. I mean, Paul Desmond's like phrasing, his rubato, I mean, his uh, vibrato going in and out and like, their, their attention to detail on that and the discipline. Should I do it? Yeah, like I mean, he's just, just playing triads. Just like he's, sticking like, in See how I was sure. trying to mess yeah. it up with the seventh and stuff? Like they're just, just the facts, ma'am. But that's exactly what this takes. Like that makes sense to me why this is a hit. It's like when jazz, great jazz musicians play a beautiful original composition, even if it's in five, that's well balanced, it can be a hit. What surprises me upon listening to this record again um, is how weird the soul, some of the soloing is, you yeah, know, sure. uh, not all of it. And, and there's nothing on there that's, that's like, oh, that's horrible. That's he's messing up. Well, let's get, I think we, we've heard enough now that we can, we can comment on the soloing. <laughs> and the we've playing. heard enough now that we can judge this record. So I have for the playing, <laughs> I'm going to go kind of low here because I'm, I have a real, I'm just not getting what Rubeck is trying to do. Yeah. And some of the stuff is meandering that we've heard so far. The, the playing of the heads is phenomenal, but the improvisation Except for to me, Paul Desmond is like kind of carrying everything. Yeah, uh, I'm putting a six, man. Mm. I could go seven, I think, because of the, how clean all the playing is. I went heads, seven. I went yeah. seven. I don't know exactly what that that means, but I felt like that was I, for for similar reasons in terms of like there's some really really good playing. I haven't heard anything that is anything just great. like flooring me. Yeah, yeah. But there's not been nothing bad, so it's just you know. Yeah. But but maybe maybe we're underrating a little bit just for everybody the rhythm section that's and the melody on a on a great hit tune like that just executing just the head good. yeah i'm gonna you know, you know I'll, I'll give it a seven i'm gonna go up to a seven because of you can't argue you with how pressure. impactful the this is how many people this has reached and and it yeah. is pretty incredible sounding so that's why for vibe i have a nine because mm. the vibe is strong on this album, the whole way through. That reverb alone is like, and I know that's part of sound, right? But I've got a nine for the vibe because I think whatever they were going for, they hit it. They hit it out of the park, like right. with the vibe. And and I am kind of digging how friggin' weird the whole record is, like compared <laughs> to other things that were happening in 1959. 59 this is was kind of weird, though. I think. What's that? Wasn't that a weird year, though? I mean, just in the world kind of but this is really its own th yeah. this thing this is a really kind of out there i think it's kind of more out there even though it's obviously extremely palatable yeah it's unique and yeah so i'm gonna give it a, a nine for that and then i'm going eight on vibe okay um just because i i think it is a great vibe but like the piano sound and condition of it kind of kills the vibe for me a little bit just the the the, the intonation of the instrument and the way it's recorded actually the way every well we'll talk about i know that's sound but to me sound has an outsized uh, impact on what the vibe is. Agreed. Now, what pushes it over the edge is like Paul Desmond's yeah, that's tone and phrasing, Joe Morello. Joe Morello's setting up take five. Eugene Wright, um, you know, his playing is just exemplary on here. I mean, it, it, and the it record is a vibe. The sound but I feel of the like bass, eight is pretty the sound high. Of the, the sound of the bass and the sound of the saxophone are world class, yeah. like 10 out of 10. And Blue Rondo a la Turk, like the way to start a record like that, that's a vibe. Agreed. You know? Agreed. Let's check out three to get ready. Let's keep it oh, rolling okay. here. Oh, yeah. That's nice. a good drum sound. Yeah, that's nice. And good playing. Woo. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, man. Some kind of cheeky about Joe Morello. You know what I mean? <laughs> Some kind of winky. It's winking. He's probably like, why do you keep giving me these weird solos? <laughs> <laughs> why are you forcing me into weird playing? <laughs> Psychedelics involved with the making of this record? Not yet. <laughs> LSD much? <laughs> Give the bass player some. I like the way Paul Desmond's coming through with some of those blues lines. It's like a 
It'd be like a, <laughs> be like a white dude with like a Brooks Brothers T-shirt on, in a blonde hair, you know, blue blood, walking to a jazz club. Oh, hello there, shit, do <laughs> Just describe my career, thanks. <laughs> you know. <laughs> This is this is both hard to do. I've written stuff like this before. You're going from three to four, especially walk. But what they're doing great on here is pulling it off to not make it feel disjointed. Yeah. Three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two. And swinging throughout it. That's not easy to do. I don't know that it's always needed to be done. I was going to say, it's, it's not easy, <laughs> but it might not be necessary at this point in the song. I know. Yeah, it might be getting a little redundant. Just keeping that same clave going, you know, that same rhythmic pattern, just becomes a little predictable, I think. Right. Is this a solo that you would transcribe? No. I'm just What he's playing is really good, but the way it's put together is weird, right? Like, but if you were to transcribe a phrase, you'd be like, that's a nice phrase I want to use. I wonder what Miles thought of this record. Surely he was asked about it all the time. <laughs> right. Because they would be in direct competition. Yeah, but well, then they're the same year. studio, yeah. same, same label. Miles was very influenced by this. I, I don't know the whole history of West Coast jazz and cool jazz, but Miles loved this sound. Uh, maybe not this like going back and forth in meters and stuff, but like the general vibe. Like this is kind of almost theatrical, the way he's playing. But that's hip, you know? Like this could be, this is like incidental music in a play, you know, like as they're changing yeah. the set, it's like this would fit cool. really good with that. Yeah, this is why, so I'm going to talk compositions. Like Shakespeare in the Park set in a 1959, bit, yeah. you know. I had eight originally, but I bumped it down to seven because there are, I mean, obviously there's some iconic compositions, Blue Rondo a la, a la Turk and Take Five, but like this has sort of that repetitive nature to it. And there's just some, yeah, it's just like, that's nice. That's yeah. really nice. I, like, they're all really solidly written. They're all really well constructed and well crafted. Woo! Yeah, I, I played oh, yeah, this I one before. This is a tough one. Surprisingly. So I've got seven for composition. What do you got? I've got nine. Nice. Actually, just, I mean, I was thinking the same thing, bump it down a little because it's, but I, to me, Blue Rondo a la Turk, although it's not a tune that I'm necessarily thinking of, I remember transcribing this early or like trying to learn it from the record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, I was, it was that captivating to me when I was younger. Um, and take five, I mean, it's kind of, to me, it's like, take the A train. Yeah, It's a like, oh, uh, but it's also like, it's actually really great, simple, it's deceptively true. simple. One of the one of the things with all of Brubeck's tunes and with Take Five Paul Desmond's tune is the melodies are incredibly strong. Yeah, incredibly yeah. memorable, singable, well written, crafty. I think it's just the other accoutrement that's going around. Yeah, around them. Like you were saying, there's some kind of funky moments or awkward moments. Yes, there's some awkward in the forms a little bit. Yeah. Um, 
but then the playing's really good throughout it, so yeah. it almost pulls together. The rhythm section together. holds it together. Yeah. I mean, obviously, they this is a band that played a lot together, too. I'm going to go eight on composition. Cool. Because I feel like nine is, is not, like, you got to really, it's got to be, like, killing it all throughout. And I think for a lot of people, this is, this is pleasant sounding. The weird part to me is all this stuff that is actually more interesting, where it's like, is it meandering? Where are they going? Yeah, yeah. Back and forth that I would think would be off-putting to your typical less snobbish kind of listener. Yeah, know? we're definitely snobbing out here a little yeah. bit. To me, like, Paul Desmond is, like, kind of... It's like, so good. It's, yeah, and he's so consistent with his sound. Yeah. That, like, he's the one, not holding it together, but, like, he's the thread that's sort of the constant. He's the most exciting part yeah. of the whole thing, yeah. The rhythm section could have been, but because of the way the tunes are and stuff, it's not... The lot biggest of, challenge is, can you go back... A lot of brushes, and, back, and then a yeah. lot of just keeping, like, a... A form that's very yeah. rigid with like having said that i couldn't imagine being played get what they have to play on this i couldn't imagine it being any better no but like this is kathy's wall is a great example here they just let it go to three for a while yeah and just hang out here and this is a very nice part like yeah like, and maybe this is what they were trying to avoid because this would have been very atypical of the time yeah to just let it open up or whatever yeah but this is nice Joe Morella, Caleb's, Caleb, producer oh, Caleb yeah. saying Joe Morella is still swinging in four, which is a great catch. Very interesting. That's what I'm saying. It's a weird record, man. That The tuning is weird. <laughs> the tuning of the piano is very weird. <laughs> Lack of tune. Well, that brings us to sound, Peter. I've got eight here, and I could take that down a little bit because of the piano, but... Well, I don't, would, I don't think that overall would sound, sound is pretty is incredible. I've got seven. I, got I think it's that. uneven. Yeah. Like the piano, not only the intonation. I don't. I'm not crazy about the actual sound. Although it's always hard to tell. When it's it, not. It doesn't. That out it doesn't pop this piano in this. I love the drums. Drums and um, uh, drums, bass, and saxophone sound incredible. Yeah, but I think that the the reverb, which I would have thought was in the room. I remember that was an old church, the 30th Street Columbia Studio, I believe, should have been more even. Like it's uneven between the instruments to yeah. me. So. It's, it does have, it, to me, it has more of a vibe than it has really great sound. Yeah, on. yeah, yeah. The bass is great. The bass might be the best. The bass sounds amazing. The bass sounds amazing. Yeah. And the drums, the drums are maybe a little heavy reverb, but that was, if that was the room, you know. It just, it sounds like the drums and the bass aren't in the same place. And I know they were, you know, which is weird. I mean, this is great playing. Yeah, this is a good solo. But coming where it does in what's happened before this, that's kind of weird that it yeah. gets to that at that point. But it's good. I mean, it's really good. Well, we have to call our, our friends down in South Louisiana to, to have some uh, qualifiers for this review of this record. <laughs> I'm, I feel like we're doing a... If I could quali if I could review our own review here, I feel like we're doing a pretty good job of trying to be honest, but yeah. also trying to be fair. It's a tough call, man. Like any of these huge records that are like millions of sellers. That's good. That's a little little stank face, but more because of the out of tune piano. <laughs> right. Um, a sequence. I'm going ten. I actually have liked the sequence. I thought it's been perfect so far for me. You don't agree? I went seven. Just because I'm like it's. It's fine, but there's no like brilliant segues or anything. I mean, I might, I could maybe be convinced to go eight just because starting with Blue Rondo All at Turk, that's great. Like, that's a really interesting thing. Oh, you know what? This was in Real Ambassadors. Everybody's jumping. This is a great tune. This is tough. Yeah. Then it goes 60s. And he just hangs here for a while. I had to oh, shed right. this when I played it, like for a week. Yeah. To build up the stamina to do that. Yeah. I played this once. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just remembering a great Montez Coleman moment playing this too. I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> Killing. 
What a great yeah. melody. Yeah. yeah. See, I went composition to eight. Now I'm feeling good about that. Yeah, you're, you're crushing it. Crushing it. <laughs> cover art, Peter. I've got a 10 out of 10 on that. I got a 10 out of 10. That's I love a beautiful it. Beautiful. I love the album. You can put the cover up. Gorgeous. Yeah, it is really nice. Look at that. Yeah, beautiful. The artist is S. Neil Fujita. Not only the yeah, art. I mean, if that's not a martini and a cigarette after a long day <laughs> on Madison and a Avenue. A couple of mush funny mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> not only the artwork, but the typography, do you call it? The yeah. fonts. The that, fonts, yeah. And the fact that they've got, uh, what does it say, featuring Take Five and Blue Rondo. I, like, I guess they already knew those were going to be the hits. <laughs> they knew from the jump. <laughs> yeah. The title is great, I think. Oh, we haven't get to that yet. Title, I've I mean, got... look at the balance of the Dave Brubeck Quartet, the way that's... The spacing on that, there's a lot goes into that. For the title, I've got... AI. I've got a seven for the title. I've got a nine. You like a, you like a pun. Time out. <laughs> well, and there's a lot of mixed time signatures in this. I could actually go up on this a little bit <laughs> because, you know, I love a simple title. Yeah. Time out. It's very simple. It's two words, one yeah. syllable each. It's a pun on the fact that these the compositions are all mixed meters. Is it a pun or is it more of an insider uh, wink? Yeah, it's kind of a it's got a play on words. We'll call it a play on words, right? More than a pun, probably. It's a play on words. Yeah. And that's the only thing dragging it down for me yeah. is the play on words. But I actually, it's not terrible. I'm gonna put an eight. It's good. Eight. I'm gonna go up. I go nine. Bump it up, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, lore. Lore. <laughs> lore. I got a nine. For really? the lore? Yeah. Yeah, I got buddy. A seven. <laughs> we are so disconnected today. But no, but we have to define lore. So I think you're, well, tell me why, why are you going nine? I'm going nine because of the sheer, like, number two on the Billboard pop charts. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Like, you know, the, the legacy of this album is so huge. Is that is, Le is legacy a part of Lord's like things that happened after the record? I came think out? so. I okay. think so. Maybe not though. I could be wrong about that. What, what no, do you no, think? No, no. You're thinking the about the story design. behind the record. That's what I meant, like the recording of it. I mean, I just don't know. I know that you know it was recorded at Columbia's 30th Street Studio, and it was in nine. Like to me, the biggest lore is it's 1959 this year that all these great records were made and came out. Kind of blue, of course, um, and others that I'm forgetting now. Giant Steps, I think. Um, I don't know. To me, the lore of it is more like what happened after, you know. Maybe it could be lore legacy. Yeah. I mean, it's been chosen to be in the Library of Congress. It's in the Grammy Hall of Fame. Okay. It's I'll go countless eight. lists eight. of... I'm going eight. Fine. What did you have it as? I had an eight as well. Okay. No, I had a nine. Sorry, yes. I had a nine. Okay. okay. Last track is Pickup Sticks. Would you like to make some adjustments, sir, to need your scoring? The bass doesn't sound as out. great as it used to on the other tracks. Right? It's a little, it's a little drop off. Well, that's the last track. I mean, well, hold on. Let's. <laughs> they, they definitely brought the fire early on this one. <laughs> this is pre loaded, pre stacked album. That's fun. I'm just checking out the bass sound between the two. Back yeah. to pick up sticks. About the same. I think we've dropped off, Caleb. <laughs> so that's a weird line, though, too. I know. That's. I, I think that's what's throwing me. It's like... So it's, and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, one. Yeah, it's in six. It feels like it's in some weird, I think, yeah. Yeah, it's very strange. It's cool. What? 
You know what it is too? Can you pause? This is the, this all this track is really summing up the whole record. It's like <laughs> it sounds good. But it's a really cool idea. Reflection. The melody is hip. What is happening with the form? Like, why are they doing it like this? You know? And this you know what I'm saying about it? It's a real weird, unique album when it comes down to it. Right. But this is an awkward thing because he's going B flat down on the um like on the A string, right? And then open D oh. like that. And then B natural. Yeah. So he's going like two, one. Like it's kind of a you can tell it's an awkward fingering. It's kind or of something. a half fingering somewhere, yeah. yeah. Should have had the piano play. We always nail the intonation on that. Not on this piano. <laughs> but I mean, his intonation is good on it. It's just something weird about it. He's still playing at four, right? Yeah. It's, the album's called Time Out. So what can you say? Four, five, one, two. It's like four plus two, but instead of it's They put all of Brubeck's good solos towards the end of the record. Yeah. It's just weird. <laughs> it's like, it's kind of segmented, you yeah. know, it's, it's conceptually. A, it's in a box. It's in a box. Yeah, and then we go to this box. box. Yeah, yeah. It's cool stuff. I feel like that bass line's not put, put him in his best outfit. That bass line is, it's not, it doesn't have a settled feeling to it. I mean, it's, it's settling. <laughs> it's repeating. Vamp punch? awkward position to pull off a solo. <laughs> huh. Okay, and that's how they're ending the album. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And we're out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to bump my sequence down from nine to eight, I think. That's what I'm saying. I yeah. had seven, man. I mean, that because... Okay. There's some good... I mean, there's nothing wrong with the actual sequencing of the tunes. Yeah. There's maybe... Maybe we're reacting a little bit to some vamps and meandering, which is kind of conceptually what the record's about. It obviously works for, for most listeners. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No hate there. And maybe we're trying to project on more onto this than needs to be there. But there are some awkward, weird moments. Yeah. I mean, actually, I would say more weird than awkward. I shouldn't say awkward. You know what? Weird can be good. I actually kind of liked the overall experience of listening to this more than I thought I would when coming into it because it is, you know, the super popular play take five kind of thing, yeah. eye roller of a thing. Yeah. Uh, I like the weirdness. Yeah. I like that they. it's an awkward experience. It's yeah. kind of fun. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a, I'm interested to see what our scores add up to here. Okay, stank face o meter. I got a five. Not too many stank face yeah. moments. And That's I think exactly it's because of the predictability of the arrangements and the forms. Yeah, like, there was a couple, but I, yeah. Like, you know, to have like... To be fair, that was the closing track. They put that at the end of the second album. Yeah, I hear you. Everyone was going to be high on psychedelics by that point. It sounds totally different to I them. think you're mixing <laughs> up which era psychedelics happened in. Because this is 1959. And that wasn't happening like 60, yet? 66, oh. 67. Age of Aquarius? When it really, yeah. Okay. Summer of Love is 67. Ah. So, you okay. know. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> is it better than KOB? 
No. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, what's so so interesting that this was recorded uh, within a few months of Kind of Blue in the same studio. Yeah, so that's crazy. So this can very much be on the same record label. And this was, well, this was produced by Teo Macero. Kind of Blue actually was, I think he was like assisting on that. But it was, yeah, it was coming out of the same Columbia jazz era. I mean, if you just take a second to compare what happens when you listen to Kind of Blue, when you compare come at Miles, all of the moments, Miles solos, all of the transitions, the playing from Train and Cannonball and Bill Evans and Wynton Kelly and of course Paul Chambers and Jimmy Cobb, yeah, like it's it's not it's gonna it's a tough measure it's a tough measure for this one I think I think so too. Having said that, the the actual playing like the players on the two records I think are all in the same league. It's they're interesting, all, right? They're all MLB. You I, know what I'm I, I saying? I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that really. <laughs> but no, I'm not. I'm not. They're saying all what the MLB. They, that's I'm, true. I'm not saying they're yeah. they're not all. They're all A tier or what, what's the good tier? S tier. Well, S tier. I would say I would say Train is S tier. <laughs> and <laughs> Miles is not. No, Miles is S tier for sure. Cannibal okay. is S tier. Right. Yeah. But you wouldn't say Paul Desmond. I don't, I wouldn't. I would say in terms of as a player, I think f- for whatever reason, and maybe we articulate some of these, maybe it's above our pay grade, on this record that it didn't become an S-tier thing to us. Yeah. Right, well, the combination. Desmond might be S-tier, actually. He's definitely A-tier. Yeah. Yeah, but S-tier is... When you put them next to Cannonball, I know that's, that's tough. That's that's true. you know. I just meant they're they're both they're all in the same. It's not like you're like I, I don't want to make it like oh this record is quality wise is such a downgrade from Kind of Blue and it's just, this is where it really does become ridiculous. Is it better than Care? One of the greatest records, but we've had other records on there that we think compete with that, maybe even surpass or in that range. Yeah. To me, this record's not really in that range even. No, but the players on it are in that range. I, I kind of agree I with say. that. I would say the weakest player on the album is actually Brubeck himself. Perhaps, perhaps, for, especially for, for the, this kind of writing. For this too. kind of right for the improvisation. Yeah. I think the writing, his writing, is what really carries. Yeah. And there's moments the group, on there yeah. that, you know, probably more Blue Rondo a la Turk for me compositionally, but and take five. I mean, there's there's moments on there that it, that are going to the mountaintop in terms of like comp, jazz compositions and just moments and the sound and I mean the rhythm section is killing. So like this this is this is big league stuff, but it's not better than KOB. So what so what, how do we score that again? KOB is a nine. Yeah. And so where does this rank in relation to that? And again, many people pointed out that we're just <laughs> putting a score to the album. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what that's yeah. literally what the score. So it's think. interesting. I have a six. I have. A, is it better than Kiba? If Kob is a nine, this is a six. Okay, I'm gonna go six. Okay, I'm gonna hide behind that six. I was thinking six to five, anywhere from five to seven. So that's six. Good. You feel good about this? <laughs> I actually do. Yeah, I feel good. I feel and good. The I'm other glad thing we listen is, to it. like, if everything is better than KOB, then nothing's be- better than KOB. That's right. If everything's as good as KOB, when, that doesn't mean this is not a, obviously a great record to listen to. Yeah. Millions of three million people have listened, have bought this record, and enjoyed it. So, and when are we going to listen to it? It's kind of like KOB, and like, I don't. I feel like I don't have to listen to it because I get to hear. I get to hear this played everywhere. <laughs> I know, know? I so know. It's like you get to hear moments of like, even it's, everybody's jumping or Kathy's waltz, you'll hear yeah. in commercials, film, TV, all that stuff. Starbucks. Starbucks. <laughs> uh, but certainly Blue Rondo, All the Turk, and Take Five. So yeah. it's interesting. It's a fun record. Yeah. So let's and add up our weird. scores. Okay. But the boom. Ow. Jeez <laughs> Louise. <laughs> I, gotta, I feel like I got to circle mine because you circle. Okay, <laughs> yeah. what do you got, Peter? What's your total score? My in your total score track? is 75. My favorite track is Blue Rondo a la Turk. My total score is 77, and my favorite track is Blue Rondo a la Turk. Oh, there we go. High five. High five. <laughs> That's creepy. <laughs> um, I think this is actually, uh, once again, I feel like this accurately reflects probably my feelings. Yeah. When yeah. I think about this album. And I think it's good. I mean, I'm, I'm a little surprised that we kind of, but, but I feel emboldened that we really both came right in the range of our ridiculous scoring system. And we had an enjoyable, and, and I kind of had a little bit of a, it was a little bit of a revelationary, re- revelation, yeah. revelationary. Yeah. I feel revel, revelatory. Yeah. Let's revel 
in our revelation about this record being kind of weird. I like that. I like it too. That's I like fun. that we're like, because I, I always just consider it like very poppy or, yeah. you know, like uh, easily digestible, but yeah. it's strange. It is strange. Yeah. It's a little hard to digest, cool. which is good. Yeah. And good for well, us. Well, I think our scoring, flax well, seeds here, are hard to digest, but they're good a, for you. <laughs> what we're proving here the is that. seed of jazz albums. <laughs> Sorry. Did I interrupt you? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> what we're proving here is that our scoring system. Endorsed again by Red Bull Racing and Andrew. I don't know why I'm bringing in. I'm bringing in the best engineering team in the Verified world. Verified by our accountants. Verified by MIT <laughs> is accurate. Yes. Till next time. You'll hear it. It's a little time out-ish, Peter. Right. Yeah, judge me.